Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS. Delighted to welcome you here to um, our humble abode uh, for this event on the Digital Silk Road. Um, we're delighted to have you. We're also delighted to have, as always, our big online uh, audience. Uh, nice to have you with us as well. Hope uh, this isn't getting distorted because it's uh, uh, loud. Um, so uh, we are here to, to talk about the Digital Silk Road, and I'll introduce that in a second in our, in our initial speakers. But let me just first do some administrative things. First, as usual, please turn off your phones or, or um, at least mute them. Uh, so they don't disturb the discussion. Um, if we have any kind of security event, I'm your warden or uh, just follow me. Basically, obviously we can go down front if, we, if that's appropriate or there are uh, emergency exits at either end here. There's an alley in the back and the rally point is uh, by National Geographic down on M Street. Um, unlikely, we've never had such a thing. So, um, uh, and um, finally, let me thank our, our sponsors, uh, JETRO, the Japan uh, External Trade Organization, which has been uh, a supporter of, of us for a long time and really appreciate their support that enables us to do uh, this kind of programming, and we really appreciate it. Um, so, Digital Silk Road. Uh, this is um, like one of these terms that has just suddenly appeared out of nowhere in the last uh, year or so, and now everybody is buzzing about it, and no one quite understands what it is. And, um, and so that's the point of today. We're going to try to understand a little bit more what we mean by the Digital Silk Road um, and why it's important for the United States to be focused on it and what we should be, um, how we should be potentially uh, engaging or responding. Um, you know, to the extent it's... Um, uh, you know, what's clear about it is that, that um, like uh, much other hard infrastructure that's being built across uh, the Eurasian supercontinent and beyond, uh, part of the digital story is about laying down of fiber optic cables and satellites and other um, hard infrastructure that's supporting the information and uh, communications technology uh, um, business. Uh, but it's also, and included in that is um, the uh, the technology that underlies um, the, uh, this um, um, telecommunications story, and particularly 5G, which we're going to hear about, I'm sure, today, and again, has been in the news a lot. I'm sure uh, that, that you all know something about that subject, but hopefully we'll, we'll delve into that a little bit more. Um, you know, by, it's, it's estimated in about five years, uh, about half the globe is going to be covered by 5G, and over a billion people will actually be using 5G technology, maybe, maybe more. Nobody quite knows. Uh, so there's a lot at stake there. Uh, this story also, though, covers the notion of um, technology that's embedded in traditional infrastructure. Roads, um, uh, bridges, pipelines all have technology embedded in them, um, and I think that's also an important part of this story, and I hope we touch on that as well. Um, all of this provides a lot of opportunities. It presents risks. Um, it produces a, a clear um, need for policy thought and discussion and policy responses. Uh, there are issues uh, ranging from privacy to security to um, commercial opportunities as well, which is all part of this story. So we think it's an important story and we, um, we're delighted that you think so enough to, to join us today. So we're, we're glad you're here. Um, CSAS has been doing a lot of work in this broad space. Uh, we have a project called Reconnecting Asia, which I think is advertised up here, uh, which John Hillman is going to talk uh, to in a minute. Um, but uh, we, we've been looking at this hard infrastructure story across the Eurasian supercontinent for the la last two or three years and have this enormous database he'll talk to you about. We also are running right now a task force on global infrastructure co-chaired by former USTR Charlene Barshevsky and former U.S. National Security Advisor Steve Hadley. Uh, we have a group of um, experts, scholars, business people, and others who are looking at uh, this story and what is at stake for the U.S. and how we should respond. So that's a big part of what we're doing. And stay tuned. We should, we're expecting uh, to have a report out in uh, mid-April. Uh, so um, please stay tuned for that. Uh, we're also doing uh, related issues in digital, uh, digital issues, digital governance. Actually, as we speak, there's, a, there's an event downstairs on APEC and, and uh, the digital governance. Uh, in the Simon Chair, we're going to be doing an event on March 4th on whose rules uh, on digital governance and the story around that. So uh, I'm sure, and our colleagues, uh, uh, Jim Lewis and the technology program does a lot of work in this space. And so uh, CSS is kind of all over uh, this uh, set of issues. 
Um, so with the shameless advertising out of the way, I think my, my uh, remaining duty is simply to introduce Kayama-san. Uh, Hirobumi Kayama is a senior advisor for Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. He's also director for Jetro in New York. Uh, he's uh, been in the U.S. for many years, not just in this uh, position, but I was interested to see that he actually has an LLM from Columbia University and passed the bar in New York, which is an impressive thing. Uh, to do. So um, we're delighted to have Kayama-san here to talk about a METI and JETRO perspective on this story of the Digital Silk Road. Kayama-san, please come on up. All right. So I have to turn the thing on. Yes. So good morning, everybody, and then thank you very much for a you know, very uh, kind you know, introduction of me, Matt. So uh, today, the, you know, on behalf of METI, Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, the Japanese government, I'd like to share with you the METI's perspectives on the Digital Silk Road Initiative by China. Uh, I'd like to explore uh, the potential U.S.-Japan collaboration on the digital aspect of Indo-Pacific strategy too. So uh, in this sense, please look at this slide. Actually, this is an excerpt from the U.S.-China Economic and National Security Review Commission uh, 2018 annual report. We can categorize projects under the Chinese Digital Silk Road Initiative into three. Number one, telecommunication infrastructure, two, e-commerce offering, and number three, smart city projects. And then today, assuming that hardware stuff basically categorized into the first one uh, will be addressed by John's presentation and then following panel. So in this sense, I'd like to focus on the second and the third pillars of the initiative and stress the necessity and urgency of public-private partnership among U.S. and Japan, given the technological leapfrogging situation in the emerging economies in Asia. Jerry Yang, co-founder of Yahoo, said in a recent interview, quote, Southeast Asia enjoying high-speed growth resembles China 10 to 15 years ago. So-called digital leapfrogging, such as wide use of mobile phones or smartphones without the period of landline use, develops more rapidly in Southeast Asia than in China." End of the quote. We have already seen that various types of digital leapfrogging in this region, such as e-commerce, ride-hailing, e-payment, uh, these leapfrogging have dramatically changed ASEAN or Indian economies and societies. Look at this slide. People in the emerging economies of Asia are much more smartphone addicted than Americans and Japanese. Last year, the Indian smartphone sales surpassed the U.S. one, and Indian, uh, Indian market became the second largest market in the world. Besides, the population in these emerging economies have considerable optimism that new technologies offer more opportunities than risks. And more importantly, relatively undeveloped infrastructure and then social systems have accelerated various efforts of problem solving by digital technologies. For example, more than half population of Southeast Asia do not have bank account, and the public trust in the currency is not high. Due to these circumstances, e-payment service 
via smartphones have spread through the you know, Southeast Asia uh, rapidly. In Thailand, 44 million people, around 60% of total population, have registered to prompt pay. This is an e-payment service promoted by the Thai Central Bank. Another instance of social problem is a traffic congestion. A congestion. You might have experienced difficulties in grabbing a taxi in Southeast Asia. Ride-hailing service companies such as Grab in Singapore or Gojek in the Indonesia have provided solutions to such circumstances. Grab, established in 2012, has increased its number of registered drivers from 100,000 in 2014 to 2.6 million drivers in 2018. That is 60, 26 times as much. And in March 2018, Grab purchased Uber's Southeast Asian businesses. Now Grab is expanding its businesses, a business domain, to a wide range of consumer and wholesale distribution and delivery services. Gojek in Indonesia has provided bike ride sharing services in Indonesia uh, where you experience a terrible traffic congestion. Now Gojek provides food delivery services, shopping agent services, and even cash accommodation services by bike drivers for consumers. Google invested in Gojek last year. As such, Asia is full of attractive and energetic entrepreneurs with a belief that she or he can make the world a better place. We saw a rise of startups or sharing businesses in 2016 in China, and now we can see the same kind of boom in ASEAN and India. Those entrepreneurs have seized business opportunities by finding challenges that society or corporations face and resolve the challenges with full use of digital technologies. In other words, Asia is hungry for technology and facing with middle income trap, even the governments in this region strongly advocating digital innovation as one of the pillars of their growth strategy. Now, many of my ASEAN friends admire China for its technologies, not the United States and Japan, nor Japan. This reminded me of an anecdote of Chinese culinary students in Tokyo. Recently, we have a lot of Chinese students who are you know, come and learn the Japanese cook food cooking in Tokyo. Almost all of, the, all of them, even after all days of China, because almost all Japanese still use paper currency and coins, and our menus of restaurants still written in paper and then unchanged uh, frequently. So, uh, look at the Chinese big ID platformers' activities. They take these rapid leapfrogging changes in Asia as new business opportunities and seize them ahead of us. While Chinese government promotes digital Silk Road initiative, Chinese private companies have taken the lead in materializing concrete projects. In addition to building uh, telecommunications infrastructure, oh, oh, oh. Chinese tech giants have accelerated their efforts of ex expanding e-commerce offerings and supplying smart city projects. From 
leading Chinese companies uh, for, the, for the leading Chinese companies in digital space, such situation in emerging economies of Asia is just like what China had experienced before, and thus they must be quite confident that those econ economies will eventually successfully develop digital economy like China. Thus, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, recently told, quote, we think that e-commerce and the in in internet are a great opportunity in Asia, and we go to places with countries with young people, countries that have a lot of small and mid-sized companies, because big companies, they don't like, they don't need us, end of the quote. In fact, in last year, Alibaba provided a city of Kuala Lumpur uh, with its city brain service for the smartization of Kuala Lumpur city. City brain service uses big data and AI on Alibaba's cloud computing infrastructure, which is adapted by the city of Hangzhou, the hometown of Alibaba city in China. This is the first case of these services being provided for a foreign country. And then IT platform businesses in Asia have grown rapidly and then Chinese IT platformers invest in various types of IT platform businesses in this region. In ASEAN, there are seven unicorns such as Grab or Gojek and they are competing each other all of the seven unicorns are injected equity by Chinese tech giants, such as Alibaba, Tencent, and Didi. In India, there are also 12 unicorns, such as Flipkart, which Walmart acquired last May. Seven out of 12 unicorns have received Chinese tech giants' equity investment. Alibaba and Tencent provide various services covering various consumer life domains. These have given, given them outstanding opportunities and capabilities of collecting wide range of data. Founding, funding power of Chinese entity is not the only strength of them any longer. The US and Japan must face up to this reality. And we also have to note that the leapfrogging technologies in Asian emerging economies are not just copycat of US or Chinese e-commerce businesses. Those technologies have developed in a manner which we have not even thought of under different environment and the different social settings. Indian company, Oil Rooms, established as a Bergen Hotel chain in 2013 has grown up to be the one of the biggest hotel chains with 400, 450,000 rooms in total. Given the price sensitivity of the market, Indian market, the company hires more than 700 AI engineers and then changes its room charges 4,300 times a day. Taking advantage of the system the company has fostered in Indian market, the company plans to expand its businesses to China, UK, as well as Japan. And I also draw, you know, would like to draw your attention to the fact that Grab and Gojek are now trying to play a key role in realizing inclusive growth or indigenous growth in their countries. For example, Gojek's business model itself facilitates income redistribution from its customers, higher income layer, to drivers and small merchants, the lower income layer. Grab launched an accelerator which provides capital for startups' business expansion 
and let them use Grab's platforms for doing businesses. So we have seen strong wants and wills in emerging economies in Asia. Meti believes that for the United States in Japan, providing funds, technologies, and market for such problem-solving businesses in Asia might be a new regional strategy as a part of Indo-Pacific strategy. Recently, you can see some Japanese companies which noticed such dynamism of digital businesses in Asia found business opportunities there. For example, last year, Toyota invested in Grab and E.ON, one of the biggest distributors in Japan, launched a business collaboration with Gojek by linking its shopping malls and Gojek's delivery services. And even successful IT platformers in Asian emerging economies, such as Grab and Gojek, are advancing to a different stage where they need to introduce deep technologies of AI or IoT. We heard from one of the executives of those companies, quote, we would like to avoid giving a handle of our nervous system, that is AI, to a big Asian nation. We feel scared of being taken data of our businesses by the nation, end of quote. So there are real needs in the emerging Asia for active participation of US and Japanese companies in digital transformation and uh, their collaboration with local IT platforms. Such contribution to the regional growth is essential for building a free and open data distribution space in this region with more with about 600 million population in ASEAN and the 1.3 billion population of India. Otherwise, a harmful digital protectionism, such as data localization, could spread around the region. Then actually, Prime Minister Abe launched the concept of data free flow with trust at the World Economic Forum in Davos. We believe that US and Japan should work together in expanding our investment in Asian problem-solving digital businesses and facilitating free and open innovation in order to materialize this concept of data free flow with trust. So what the government could do in this area? As you've already known, the US and Japan agreed to cooperate on the digital aspect of Indo-Pacific strategy, in addition to the infrastructure and energy aspects. As to the digital aspect, of course, the security of next generation telecommunications infrastructure, such as 5G networks or submarine cables, is one of the very important agenda of US-Japan cooperation. But at the same time, US-Japan joint engagement in the problem solving digital businesses in the emerging Asia is also essential. So uh, uh, needless to say, the private companies should play leading roles in these efforts, but simultaneously, governments should play effective roles in providing a sound environment where private companies can enjoy free and open innovation. The rapid expansion of the fourth industrial revolution has also rapidly increased speed of business cycle, size of businesses, and risks associated with them. Thus, we have to recognize the necessity of securing risk money for supporting rapid digital innovation in Asia while avoiding harmful crowding out. In the United States, the Build Act we strengthen the risk money provision function for its private sector. In Japan, JBIC, 
Japan Bank for International Cooperation has strengthened its equity financing function and contributed to accelerating digital innovation in Asia. US and Japan should pursue a further strengthening and effective coordination of such policy-based financing. Besides that, we have to undertake an international rulemaking regarding trade, e-commerce, investment, technology protection, privacy, infrastructure development, which can accommodate rapidly changing business environment caused by digitalization and globalization. The concept of data free flow with trust is one of the important pillars of this international rulemaking. At the same time, US and Japan can work together in capacity building efforts in the emerging Asia for proper implementation of those international rules. In conclusion, again, we are very much confident of the effectiveness of the US-Japan Indo-Pacific strategic cooperation in the areas of energy and infrastructure. Now, we have to expand such effective collaboration into the area of digital innovation in Asia. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm John Hillman, director of the Reconnecting Asia Project, which is um, what we keep advertising here, and I would encourage you to check it out if you haven't already. Um, for almost four years now, we've been mapping infrastructure across the Eurasian supercontinent, um, tracking not only China's Belt and Road, but also many of the other connectivity initiatives that are underway. Um, and you can view a lot of the projects that we're tracking on our website, um, where we also have news and analysis. Um, one of our recent reports um, was being handed out earlier. Hopefully, you got a copy. Um, and if not, it's on the website. It's called Influence and Infrastructure. And um, it basically tries to lay out the ways in which states use infrastructure projects to advance strategic objectives. Uh, and while the, while the report is intended to help um, serve as a guide for making sense of current developments, uh, it draws from examples throughout history. And so what I'd like to do briefly this morning is share one of those examples with you. Uh, but let me start first by underscoring what's relatively new, and that's China's rise as a leading provider of infrastructure beyond its borders. So let's just for a minute consider one type of telecommunications infrastructure, uh, which are submarine fiber optic cables. I feel like that doesn't get a lot of attention right now. We're all concentrated on wireless networks, um, but these are incredibly important. They carry the vast majority of international data. Um, and a decade ago, Chinese companies were involved with just a handful of these cables. Um, and th those projects were almost exclusively in China, Taiwan, or Hong Kong. And as you can see now, China's share is growing quite dramatically. Um, it's a landing point, China's a landing point owner or supplier for 11.4% of these cables globally, uh, and more than twice that, 24% of planned cables. The share is, as you might expect, even higher in Asia, um, you know, almost 30% of existing cables and over half of planned cables. Um, one of China's planned cables in Asia is a project may, maybe some of you have heard of. It has a clever acronym, which I'll let you figure out. Um, and it went in pr into production last October. When completed um, in 2020, it will become the shortest route for high-speed internet traffic between Asia and Africa. The cable will begin in Gwadar, which as some of you know, is a key part of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Um, which is a flagship, probably the flagship corridor of China's Belt and Road. And what's striking about this project, among other things, um, is how this cable and several others like it are literally retracing the steps of great powers that came before China. So a century and a half ago, Britain was wrapping the world with telegraph cables, including one through Gwadar on its way to India, which was Britain's prized colonial possession at the time. And while every historical comparison has its limits, uh, I think this, this case illustrates how what begins as a commercial contest can quickly become a strategic contest. 
Um, and I think it's also worth noting that these cables, while a bit slower, um, they were cutting edge technology uh, of the day. So in 1865, sending a telegram from Britain to India took five to six days and it involved up to 14 relay stations. At each of those relay stations, the message was um, received, decoded, and then physically transferred to someone else who coded the message and sent it um, onto the next relay system. Um, and so this was you know, quite difficult. Sometimes ma messages are arriving mangled. Um, and it's sort of a, an international game of telephone before the telephone. And it was quite expensive to play. A 20-word message cost the equivalent of roughly $800 today. Um, these early, these early uh, communication um, infrastructure types were also plagued by design and operational challenges. In the telegraph's first few decades, there were no international standards, uh, and wires were being produced according to various specifications. Um, engineers were basically through trial and error still figuring out what materials were best for different climates and how to protect wires against common threats, ships, anchors, and stormy seas, and so on. The first cable to India was laid in two sections, um, and both failed, leaving the British government dependent on a connection that ran through the Ottoman Empire and that was therefore vulnerable to being monitored. And frustrated by that experience, the British government decided to provide limited support for surveying new routes, for negotiating access, and for laying a set of strategic cables. In the meantime, uh, Britain's global share of telegraph cables was expanding rapidly, and that was driven par primarily by commercial motives. Um, British firms had laid the, first, the very first cables in the 1850s, and their innovative materials and techniques eventually dominated the market, so much so that um, Britain's largest telegraph company manufactured two-thirds of the cables used in the 19th century, and almost half thereafter. Um, and in 1896, Britain owned um, 24 of, thir of the world's 30 cable-laying ships. So this is a, an illustration of one of their, the very first cable-laying ships. But Britain owned 24 of 30 of them um, at the close of the century. Eventually, though, strategic concerns took hold. Um, at the close of the 19th century, the British government began developing a smaller system of cables that touched only Britain and its possessions. And this network of all red routes um, was actually largely opposed by some within the British government, the Treasury, um, but they were essentially outmaneuvered by Britain's defense agencies, um, which, as the historian Paul Kennedy has written, developed a virtual fetish for these routes. These investments had little commercial value, but they paid off in the coming years as competition among Europe's great powers escalated and finally spiraled out of control. And so for German officials, the guns of August were followed by a deadly silence. On August 5th, 1914, a day after declaring war on Germany, Britain cut five of Germany's telegraph cables, which remained disabled for the duration of the war. And so Britain's advantages in that conflict stem not only from owning and operating infrastructure, but also the abilities of its companies and the international standards they set. Uh, and in mon monopolizing much of the expertise to lay and repair cables, um, that ensured that Britain's rivals were unable to, to do so themselves. So I think the story could end there, um, and it would be something of a cautionary tale about um, how commerce can quickly turn into a strategic contest. But I think the real story is a little more complicated, and so there are at least two other dimensions that I think are worth pausing on just in conclusion. Um, one of those is that the telegraph was ultimately a double-edged sword for Britain. So it solidified Britain's control over its colonial territories initially, but then eventually these same um, infrastructure types undermined that control. British cables did not only carry colonial commands, but also potent ideas for change. Especially in India, nationalist movements used these tools in their fight for independence, and Britain's censors were unable to stem the flow of news and communication. The other dimension that I think is worth pausing on is that the source of Britain's commercial success as a global hub for communications was due in large part to its openness. So during the global telegraph race, unlike most countries, Britain granted rights for landing cables on its territory without restrictions. 
So far from weakening its firms, it was this openness that helped turn London into the global communications and financial hub that it remains today. So collectively, I think these experiences suggest that while communications infrastructure can offer strategic benefits, um, those benefits indeed come with some unintended consequences, especially for those who try to censor and control information flows. These experiences might also suggest that um, limited strategic investments could be worthwhile, but that it would be a mistake to allow strategic concerns to fully eclipse economic fundamentals, which often provide the longer term, more lasting benefits. And so as I mentioned in the beginning, every historical comparison has its limits. Uh, th this report that we just put out is fu filled with examples. Um, and I think that as new as many of develop today's developments are, including with much of the new technology, they're perhaps not entirely unprecedented. So uh, I'd encourage you to visit our site, to check out the report, um, and to help, you know, help us make sense of these developments. Let us know what you think. Um, and with that, um, thank you, and let me welcome our panel onto the stage. Hi, uh, good morning everyone. I am Kate O'Keefe. I'm a reporter with the Wall Street Journal uh, covering US-China issues and I'm gonna be your moderator for this panel. Um, and I'd like to quickly introduce our panelists. Uh, to my left, we have Robert Atkinson. Rob is the founder and president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, which is a think tank focused on science and technology policy. Uh, we also have Emily Rahala, Emily was, until September, the Washington Post China correspondent, and she's now based here in DC covering foreign affairs. Uh, and at the end, we have William Mayville. Bill is the former deputy commander of the US Cyber Command and a former director of the Joint Staff. So hopefully we'll have a lot of interesting discussion for you. Um, I'd like to get things started with a more general question um, that I hope, Rob, you'll be able to uh, take the first stab at this one. Um, my question is, what are the key components of China's digital Silk Road plan, and what is Beijing hoping to accomplish with this plan? Sure, well, thank you, Kate, and, and uh, I think it's a pleasure to be here. So I think what you have to understand about this plan is um, China has a strategy. Uh, Xi Jinping has said that the strategy is to uh, be the master of our own technologies. <clears throat> And by that, they mean they don't want to be dependent upon American, Japanese, or European technology. They want to make all of their own. And when I say all, I mean all. Uh, and so the second component of Chinese strategy is what they call the going out strategy. And this is the idea that the first phase of indigenous innovation, which is sort of early, a little bit before made in China 2025, was really to sort of gain market share at home. Uh, think about it as kind of an, a protected aircraft carrier. You've got market share, they sort of kicked Google out, and now, now they've got Baidu, and they don't really allow Amazon in, and all. so they have this protected market. The next step is to go out and gain, uh, gain market share. They're not gonna go out and gain market share in the US for a couple of big, or Europe, or frankly Japan, uh, for a couple of big reasons. Number one, uh, the technologies aren't as good. Um, they, they give you pretty good technology at a discount. That's kind of the, that's kind of the business model and the deal. Um, and secondly, they're facing robust competitors in those home markets. And now thirdly, as we're seeing in the last year, they're facing a lot of distrust and security concerns and all that. So the core kind of phase where China is right now is to gain market share in sort of third markets, if you will, particularly Southeast Asia and Africa. And that's really what the digital Silk Road is all about. It's to basically give them help, but tie that help 
to uh, selling from Chinese digital companies, Huawei, ZTE, Alibaba, and the like. So at one level, it's good because those countries need better digital infrastructure and digital services, but on the other level, we have to understand what it is. It's a pure, it's pretty clear industrial policy play for them to gain market share for their companies. And then once they have that, which by the way means that U.S. companies don't have that market share, then the next step after that would be to try to, to go out and try to uh, you know, gain market share in Europe, U.S. and Japan. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Bill, can I go to you for uh, some of the military implications of this strategy by China? Sure. Um, first, let me back up and just say that um, today the only superpower that is a uh, great, great power that's capable of deploying military might globally is the United States. No one can uh, produce the type of joint force um, that is uh, that the U.S. military can do. Now, um, increasingly in the past 15 or 20 years, the means by which we've been able to do that has become even more reliant on, on industry. Um, today, uh, we are heavily reliant on partnerships within key verticals such as energy, um, the transportation sector, um, information and um, um, technology sectors. And so for our ability to um, deploy and project power from our space into another space, uh, the way in which we move it and the way in which we sustain it um, is, is largely in concert with um, the powers that res reside at the homeland. So the home, the home game and the away game are merged. What we see here with the digital Silk Road that China is doing is attempting to create um, an alternative system that will compete with that. Um, the global telecommunication infrastructure is intended to connect countries um, under a single technology standard. Um, and what that does for China is it gets, allows them not only to get in front of the, um, the global economy um, that will be increasingly more digital, it will allow them to in addition to tapping new markets, it also allows them to set the technology standards, the priorities, and to dominate. Um, it allows them to overpower competitors uh, at its scale. It preys on smaller economies. Uh, it gives them the tools to, to keep them under check. Uh, it creates dependencies. Um, it, uh, it gains access to data. Uh, and we have to remember it does that with companies that are subjected to and must comply with domestic Chinese law. So you have a revisionist, revisionist power emerging that is challenging fundamentally the way in which we underwrite global security. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go to Emily now for some more specifics. Um, so Emily, I wanted to ask you, um, how do Chinese telecoms companies like Huawei and ZTE fit into this digital Silk Road plan? Um, and what impact could the recent US indictments against Huawei have on the company and on China's broader plans to try to dominate global 5G? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, my notes are on my phone. Um, I am a millennial, but I'm not currently on Instagram, uh, in case anyone's wondering. Um, I think it's a really important and complex question. Um, the first thing is when we talk about the digital Silk Road, what are we actually talking about? And, and there's two levels here, right? One is you know, the specific elements of Chinese industrial policy, um, which are you know, laid out in various plans and are part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And the second level um, um, is one that um, both my co-panelists have referred to, which is this level of strategic competition. So it's, it's operating both in specific concrete ways and in broader strategic ways, and I hope we can discuss both today. Um, in terms of concrete you know, business operations, I think what we're seeing is that the Belt and Road Initiative has just thrown a ton of money into this space. And so for specific companies like Huawei and also for others, this means um, that there's contracts to be filled and whether that means building telecommunications infrastructure, um, 5G, um, providing services in various local economies, that's really how they fit into this picture. Um, 
And of course, the exact relationship between those companies and the government is um, a subject of much current debate. Um, at this broader strategic level, uh, I think we really have seen with the recent developments in the Huawei case, the extent to which um, the Chinese state is going to back companies that are part of this. So, for instance, if a country were to arrest the CFO of a large Chinese telecommunications firm um, on charges related to alleged sanctions violations, we would see a very forceful response um, from the Chinese government. In terms of what the indictments um, mean for Huawei and more broadly for Chinese companies operating in the space, um, it's too soon to know exactly, but I think it would be hard to find someone who would argue that this has been good news um, for Huawei or indeed for other Chinese telecommunications and tech firms. Um, what we've seen over the last few months is this sort of effort, um, I think US-led effort, that's fair, to rally um, members of the Five Eyes, Five Eyes Intelligence Sharing Network around uh, sort of the US position on Huawei as a potential security threat. Um, Huawei has been saying for years, I think quite fairly, uh, if you're gonna say we're a security threat, show us the evidence. And what we saw at that press conference two or one week ago, I forget, was really the first time that we've seen what the United States um, Department of Justice plans to try to prove in court. They have not been proven in court, but these sort of meaty details about sneaking into labs and stealing um, robotic arms, which are allegations that have not been proven in court, I think are gonna have a big impact on public opinion, particularly among Five Eyes Nations. Um, I'm covering Canada right now, and certainly in Canada, the cost of the government going ahead with Huawei and 5G has just gone way up. Um, but I do think it's important to note that elsewhere in the world, the company is doing really well. And a really interesting question for the United States, Japan, and for Europe is, you know, despite the US raising all these security concerns about Chinese telecommunication firms, they continue to dominate in many markets. And so a key question for the United States is, is why this company is still so attractive and why its services are still being um, popular. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Um, if any of the other panelists wanted to respond to any of the issues Emily just raised, um, feel free. Um, and then I also have a follow-up question, which is, um, what do you guys think are the main potential security risks with Huawei? And is there actually anything at this point that Huawei or China could do to convince skeptics that the company is actually not a security risk? So maybe we'll, we'll start with you, Bill, on that. Well, I'm probably the wrong guy to start with because my answer is absolutely nothing. Um, ZTE, um, Huawei, uh, is in the same category as Kaspersky, Kaspersky Labs. Um, the, uh, the risks are one of surveillance, cyber attacks, cyber disruptions. Um, and um, uh, so I, I, I'm firmly in the camp of, um, of, uh, of telling our partners and allies that if you want to remain interoperable with us, you have to participate in an alternate solution, and we need to partner with them to figure that, put that out, and we need to extend that, because I think economically what it does is it, it robs competitiveness in other markets, uh, and it prevents uh, emerging co economies, opportunities to participate uh, in the global community. So I think in every category, um, we should uh, um, push very back hard against what Huawei, which is a state-run enterprise, um, is, uh, uh, is doing. I can sort of jump into that. Yeah, please. So uh, I have a couple of things here. One is um, there's another issue here besides security, and that's, that's a sort of global market share. Um, the U.S. used to be the world leader in telecom equipment. Uh, we had Western Electric, which became Lucent, and now we don't, <laughs> which, which is a serious problem. But we don't have one. And so uh, it's an interesting thing because it, it, we don't have a dog in the fight from a sort of industrial policy or competitiveness challenge. The Europeans have that dog. And uh, that, that's Ericsson and uh, Nokia, but if you, who are the two sort of dominant players, if you will, uh, outside of China. But if you just look at um, Huawei, Nokia, Ericsson, Cisco, ZTE, they have 75% of the worldwide revenue in this area. 
but in the last three years, Huawei's uh, market share has gone up four percentage points, all at the expense of Nokia and Ericsson. Uh, Huawei's telecom revenue now is twice as, but is, is a little bit larger than Nokia and Ericsson combined. So they're, they're a big company. Uh, they're also a unique company in the sense of, uh, in the U.S., we tend to have these sort of verticals, we have companies that make chips and companies that make computers and companies that make phones and companies that make telecom equipment. Huawei is sort of the, you know, the integrator. It makes everything. Uh, and it would be interesting to see whether that model really works. It seems to work pretty well for them. So that's one issue. I mean, you could imagine a world in 10 years where you really don't have any other choices, uh, where, where you get Ericsson and Nokia uh, you know, at a smaller, much smaller share of themselves and can, because of the capital costs of R&D are so high for this industry, you, know, you have to have enough scale to be able to keep innovating and maybe you get to a tipping point where you just can't do that anymore. So I think that's one issue. The second issue on security, it's not so much I think whether you can prove that things are secure or not secure, it's that the emerging systems are harder to judge, uh, particularly as we move to what are called software-defined networks. Networks in the past, the functionality was all hardwired in, and now we're moving to what's called software-defined networks. Uh, and from talking to experts, uh, software-defined networks are just much more vulnerable. Uh, well, that's not the right way to put it. Software, it's harder to determine on software-defined networks whether they've been compromised or not. I think that's the key thing. I mean, if you think about your car, for example, if you have a relatively new car, like a Tesla, the software gets updated all the time. Well, how sure are you? So you've, you, you, you've approved that first set of software, you've gone through every line of code, but now there's an upgrade. How sure are you that that upgrade is legitimate? And so I think that is raising some interesting and important questions. I'm not gonna judge whether they are inherently unsafe or not. That's what people in the US government do for a living, but it does raise a certain questions. And then lastly, on the 5G itself, because of the network architecture and typology, does also raise other sorts of vulnerabilities that are sort of the 4G network don't raise. And so I think, again, that is one of the reasons why the five eyes are thinking much more about this than they were in a, in a 4G world. Um, as to whether anything could convince people that Huawei is now safe, um, if I was advising the company, I would uh, give them the following advice. I would say, you know, rigorously defend yourself in court, in US court. Um, there's clearly a demand in the United States for more information about this company's um, corporate governance structure, its operations, and its relationship with the government. I would encourage the company to provide that information. And I think um, the company's response to this whole case has been revealing. They have said, well, you know, we'll fight this in court, we abide by relevant laws. Um, so this also has to do with the Chinese government response, which has in some ways been much more forceful um, and in some ways much more revealing than the corporate response. Um, if the Chinese government wants companies to see Huawei as a neutral actor, um, it should consider you know, how the arrest, um, detention of two Canadians on vague security charges is playing internationally and you know, the impact that that's had among um, you know, the West broadly um, and other allies, including Japan, on, on the willingness to do business with these companies. Um, yeah, actually, Emily, do you have any other insights into what sort of the everyday Canadian thinks about Huawei now? I mean, was Huawei really on the radar of Canadians until this extradition request? Uh, it was a little bit on the radar because they sponsor Hockey Night in Canada, which is um, our most popular <laughs> television broadcast ever, historically and currently. Um, so they really made this, this very successful frankly, push into Canada, um, certainly relative to other markets, including the United States. Huawei has made investments, um, research partnerships with Canadian universities. You know, they sponsor hockey. If you're walking around Toronto, you see ads for Huawei phones. Um, I don't think the average Canadian before this played out, um, other than a large number of, you know, Canadians of Chinese ancestry or with ties to China, really knew about their products, didn't know much about their phones. So their first real introduction to this um, question is you know, the detention of these two Canadians on the ground in China in what is widely seen as retaliation for Hmong's um, arrest in Vancouver. And 
prior to this whole incident, the Canadian government had said, we're coming in, we're going to engage with China, we shouldn't be afraid of China, we want to do more trade with China, and now they're, for they're being forced by public opinion to walk that back. And you know, if that's not a lesson for you know, companies like this and for the Chinese government, um, I'm not sure what is, although they don't show any sign of wanting to back down on this case. Yeah, it's definitely a unique PR strategy. Um, so, Rob, if I could just follow up on something you mentioned earlier. You mentioned Nokia and Ericsson um, and the fact that the U.S. doesn't have really an equivalent to Huawei. Um, I'm wondering what countries, what, what alternatives countries actually have if they don't want to use Huawei. I mean, are these two Nordic companies going to just supply the entire world's 5G? I mean, how does that actually realistically work? I should also mention uh, Samsung is, a, is a, an emerging player in the 5G marketplace, and uh, they're investing a lot and have, you know, very, seem like good offerings as well. So I don't, absolutely, Ericsson, Nokia, Samsung, there's no reason they couldn't supply the world market with, uh, with 5G. Uh, they, just, they just build more factories. It's not hard to do. Um, I think the question, I think, is much more about we appear, and, and, and by the way, this isn't just about telecom equipment, as, as the other speakers alluded to. It's about e-commerce, uh, search, uh, a whole wide variety of uh, new uh, ICT business models. And generally, the U.S. Uh, and Europe have not been very aggressive in that space, uh, in, in, in that region. They, they really have sort of let Huawei and these other companies go out there and just take it. Uh, I mean, Huawei is an incredibly sophisticated company when they go to these places, Kazakhstan or these other countries. They, they, they go there, they build relationships, they, they even have like scholarships for high school kids or college kids to come to Beijing. I mean, they, they're, they're very sophisticated. And, and I don't see um, American and European companies with the same level of response. And so at one level, we're getting what we deserve because we're not doing it. And secondly, I, I think our foreign uh, aid policies, and, and, and in particular Europe, but also the U.S., where are we? I mean, you know, the, the, you can say that the Chinese are putting, you know, unfair amounts of money in there, but they're putting a lot of money into that. And where are we? What, why isn't uh, uh, AID or, or uh, OPEC or the European Development Bank, why aren't they putting a massive, massive effort in there? And then secondly, tying it to uh, commercial advantage. I mean, I, I know you're not supposed to say that in Washington because we're all supposed to be totally altruistic and helping them and nothing for ourselves. I don't think that world is real anymore. Uh, the Chinese have shown that's not real. And so if we're going to give them aid for telecom, they need to buy our equipment. And, and we don't seem to be doing that. So at one level, I'm not surprised that Huawei, ZTE, and these other companies are making such important advances because they're, they're sort of pushing against an open door. Um, that's a really good point. Um, I guess we can give Huawei maybe a little break for a second. Um, and I have a question about another aspect of the uh, Digital Silk Road, which is actually the uh, very popular messaging app WeChat. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Emily, uh, what role does this app play in the, in the broader Digital Silk Road plan? And also, what do you make of, of reports that the, the Chinese government is actually able to censor WeChat uh, well beyond China's borders? Thanks. Um, I think understanding WeChat is really important, um, both in terms of you know, the day-to-day -day use of the internet and also this broader question of strategy and multipolarity and, and how we think about the internet going forward. Um, WeChat, as I'm sure most folks in this room know, is the Chinese messaging app, but it's sort of evolved into an entire online ecosystem. And it's hard to overstate just how popular it is. Um, whereas in the United States, lots of people are using a variety of different apps um, in the United, or sorry, in China. Almost everyone is using WeChat from little kids to, you know, I've interviewed 79-year-olds who are doing all their online shopping on WeChat. And when we used to think about Ch the China's internet um, going back to 2009, 2010, even further along, we used to think, okay, well, China's now developing an intranet. In 2009, the government sort of famously turned off the internet uh, in the Northwest after unrest. And that was sort of the framework we're using to understand the internet in China. What WeChat sort of 
worldwide popularity among Chinese speakers and the Chinese diaspora and others has taught us is that the walls of this sort of new Chinese online, commercial, social, cultural ecosystem are much more blurry. Um, to give one example, um, recently in a Canadian political race in British Columbia on the West Coast, um, a candidate was sort of forced to resign from the race after posting a Chinese language comment on WeChat um, that a lot of people thought was sort of um, racially divisive. Um, and so this idea of different conversations happening in different online ecosystems I think is really critical to understanding. Um, another example, um, yeah. I've been reporting on the crackdown and mass internment of uh, ethnic Turkic Muslims in China's Xinjiang province. And when we interview um, families of people who are currently in those camps, um, one of the most common things they say is that their WeChat messages to their loved ones are either being intercepted, um, completely centered, censored, and or they're getting um, threatening messages on WeChat. So in really practical ways and sort of really big picture ways, it's changing how we understand um, China's online environment. Um, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to know if any of the other panelists uh, wanted to flag any other companies or specific technologies that are important for us to sort of keep an eye on as we're assessing the digital Silk Road plans. Um, and if I could throw that to you, Bill, please. Um, yeah, well, sure. Um, there, the BDS navigation system is problematic, particularly when China's already demonstrated a willingness to, to militarize space. Um, the sensors, the enhanced guidance, the dual use of this, in addition to everything that's doing um, uh, in, the, in uh, the cyber domain um, is, is problematic. Um, I think anything that um, enhances, um, if you will, I don't know if this is the correct framework or not, but uh, you know, allowing China to, to have digital sovereignty in a region is problematic. I think we have to look at what enables that and say, why is that? And is that good for all of us? Um, we have yet to see, but the promise of, as of, I, of AI, 5G, AI, um, I'm concerned about um, when the infrastructure is in place and now you see the introduction of internet application platforms and digital services, that, that kind of soft penetration. Um, so I, I think that it's, it's um, what all happens downstream and how does this modernize, how does modernization further enhance the grip of China in, in, uh, in certain regions and across the globe. And my fundamental premise is that um, China is, is unfit to, to own large chunks of the world's communication infrastructure. And um, given its extensive surveillance, given its censorship, given the fact that it has for years been stealing in, uh, property, um, intellectual property, um, you know, it just, it's, it's just wholly um, um, problematic. So, you know, I, I start with a, an inherent distrust of this actor, and uh, and I question the motivations behind all of its modernization because of this, you know, thing that I, you know, where I just think that they have demonstrated uh, that they are they are willing to use um, this for the betterment of China, and not necessarily um, when it's not convenient for them to uh, look at uh, how this really impacts access to the global commons. So I think I would agree with uh, what the Lieutenant General said. I think um, 5G is going to be uh, pr probably the most important one. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, sort of unwarranted paranoia about this. Uh, that, you know, whether they do well in 5G or not doesn't mean that we're not going to have 5G in the U.S. We will have 5G in the U.S. no matter what. Uh, the benefits of 5G are in the application space, and so we can buy Ericsson, uh, Samsung, or Cisco equipment, uh, it doesn't really matter, uh, and, and we'll do well in 5G. So when everybody says China's winning the 5G race, I think they're missing part of the point. Uh, the point of 5G is just we're going to have a better network, uh, and highly unlikely it's going to be a Chinese network at this point in time. Um, I think another area is biometrics. The Chinese are going great guns in biometrics, particularly facial recognition. 
you can say what you want about facial recognition, <clears throat> but I believe facial recognition is going to be a very important technology going forward. It's going to make our lives a lot easier and better. Um, but it's a complicated and expensive technology to develop, and the Chinese could gain global market share in that and, and, and really you know, be the sort of default provider in, in that space. And then lastly, AI. Uh, you know, AI, one of the key things that AI depends upon is data, and the Chinese are no compunctions about <laughs> enabling large amounts of data to be collected. Uh, so I think you know, those are some of the big things. I, I do want to argue, though, that I think we're, we tend to, again, overly panic about some of this. Um, <clears throat> when China goes and uses the digital Silk Road and their incentives and other packages to convince some country in Southeast Asia to buy their equipment or to buy their cameras or whatever they buy, <clears throat> it's important to recognize that the country that has those cameras or equipment is setting the rules and setting the law. It's not like China saying, we'll only, <clears throat> we'll only sell you Huawei <clears throat> telecom equipment, but you have to agree to spy on your citizens. China fundamentally doesn't care about that. They just want to sell the stuff. I mean, it's just, it's a commercial transaction. They spy on their citizens at home, but they're going to leave those decisions about surveillance and, and, and privacy and all those other things, those really are left up to the countries that are buying this stuff. Uh, and as far as I can tell, there doesn't appear to be any sort of arm twisting based upon that we're giving you money and so you have to do that. What I think is more problematic is that countries are looking at China and going, oh, I like that model. Uh, I get to control my citizens. I'm going to do that too. But you have to remember that's different than China sort of imposing that model in them. It's a, the problem is I think that China is just something that a lot of countries now emulate, uh, largely because I think of a failure of the U.S. to push back adequately to say that our system is better and gets you better innovation. Um, but so I, I think it's, you know, those countries are still in play in my way of looking at it. We, you know, we can influence them and we should try to. Um, just a quick follow up. So you mentioned that you think there's a lot of undue panic and that, you know, countries who are using Huawei equipment are able to sort of set their own rules. Um, I think that is a controversial view. There's certainly some out there who believe that Huawei has backdoor access to its equipment. So I was wondering what you think about that. Do you think that's just fear mongering or is that a legitimate concern? Well, that's a different issue. Uh, whether they do or whether they don't, I don't know. Uh, but that's not setting the rules. They're not, you know, let's say, let's just say for the sake of argument that they have a back door. Uh, the government that they're selling this to or the country they're selling it to might have rules that say you cannot use back doors, you cannot spy, you can so they're not forcing the country to change the rules. If they have a back door, that's something they would be doing surreptitiously, not in direct partnership with, uh, with the government of a country, necessarily. I think I broadly agree, but this question of um, the long arm of the Chinese state, I think I agree that they're not saying buy our telecommunications equipment and, and then you have to spy on your citizens. Um, but this sort of broader use of defining China's national state security um, across borders, I think, is really significant. Um, in recent years, you know, I covered the case of a Swedish national abducted from his um, vacation house in Thailand and renditioned mysteriously to China, that he shows up and says, you know, I, I kidnapped myself and took myself to China. I'm paraphrasing, but, and I think we're going to see this kind of, this kind of action in the digital space, and we, we already are seeing it. Um, in real ways among di in diaspora communities and among critics of the Chinese government. Um, so I think that's, to me, that's where it, that plays in, but I, I agree broadly with what you said. Um, one other point I wanted to make was that in the United States, the response to all this is really being led by um, the security and intelligence community, which is very important, because I think it's very clear that there are real security and intelligence considerations here. But when we're talking about something as broad and as personal as the internet and how we interact online, from a strategic perspective, the United States and its allies need to think about how and why people use the internet. Um, I'll use myself as an embarrassing example. Um, I know that WeChat is surveilled and censored. I've you know, showed up in small Chinese villages and had people waiting for me there because I discussed plans on WeChat. Um, I know it's dangerous, I know it's not secure, and yet, it's still on my phone. 
I do have a phone without it, for the record. <laughs> but um, what is the United States, what are other allies offering as a product-wise, as a sort of alternative to this? If um, Huawei's telecommunication networks work really well and they're affordable, if their internet ecosystem, if Alibaba, if WeChat are really great internet experiences, people are gonna use them, especially at a time when faith in US technology is at like negative 10 billion. Um, when I say to people, oh, you know, what about WeChat? It's, you know, it's surveilled. And they're like, I'm on Facebook. Um, whether that's fair or not, the, the current perception is that there's, on some levels of uh, an equivalence when it comes to using the internet. Um, and I think strategically, one consideration is what is the response to that? So <clears throat> it's not equivalent. <clears throat> and the idea that people think it's equivalent, <clears throat> I, know, <clears throat> I know you're not saying they think that, but the fact that anybody in the US could think they're equivalent tells you they don't know what they're thinking about. Uh, Facebook <clears throat> does not sell its data to advertisers. When you advertise on Facebook, you don't get to know that it was you that saw my ad. I get to know all I get to know, on, and I'm not defending Facebook per se, but there's so much mythology that's gotten in the last year of this tech clash and this demonization. The business model is to match customers to ads anonymously. Secondly, Facebook uh, and every American internet company does everything possible to resist the US federal government from getting into their networks. Now they obey the law and it, worst comes to worst, you know, push comes to shove, they will do it if there's a legitimate court order, but every single one of those companies has a big legal department and all they do is they push back against the US government trying to get inside their, uh, you know, with court orders to get inside their network because they want to protect that. That was that whole Apple case with, the, with encryption. Chinese companies do not do that. Anytime a Chinese company were to raise one little iota of complaint, they would be completely uh, taken down. I always remember this meeting I had, at, I won't say which company, it was a pretty major Chinese internet company in Beijing, and uh, we're in there as a group of us, and, and I asked this guy a question, and um, you know, some question about the government, something, he said, well, I'm really not allowed to answer that, let me turn it over to the Communist Party official for him to answer. Can you imagine going out to Microsoft and saying, hey, what do you, what do you guys think about the federal privacy rules? And I'm sorry, we can't answer that. Let me turn it over to the Department of Justice official. <laughs> you know, so it, it really is completely different. And part of that, I think this is the other point, I think we're really, really making it, and we're gonna look back on this in 10 years and go, what in God's name were we thinking? Because the Chinese government is not attacking its tech champions. It's doing the opposite. It's doing everything possible to prop up its tech champions. What are we doing? We're demonizing these companies. We're bringing bogus privacy cases against them, sometimes, not all the time. We're threatening antitrust cases against them. The Chinese government knows that the way they're gonna win this is not by breaking up their platforms and their and their dominant players, it's to build them up. And we're going in the exact opposite direction, I would argue, and it's gonna make it harder for us to project our soft power uh, throughout the world when, if we do that. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts on that. I struggle to understand, despite China's economic growth, this one-party system, um, how it survives promoting multinational capitalism. I, I, I struggle to understand that. I think it's, um, it, there's an impending catastrophe between the state and the state's economy, um, unmet expectations of its middle class, global competition, uh, unable to provide um, um, alternatives to the free trade system developed by democratic nations. And if it has, um, when that moment comes, um, laid the infrastructure uh, in place and it goes unchecked, um, I, I think we find ourselves in a very difficult position to project um, power, to provide an, an alternate response. And the difficulty we have here is, is cyber in general has enabled new forms of power, pr principally economic and political power, and we haven't yet come to terms with that. When we, to the extent that it has um, application in terms of the traditional forms of military power, what we're really finding is that given the, that cyber today doesn't really generate um, anything more than temporal and, and, and uh, limited concessions, that's what it's able to produce for military. There's no knockout punch. 
it really means that for the defense, the, 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 for military, uh, you're on the defense. And, um, and what we have right now strategically is um, because of new forms of political and, and, and principally economic power, and a, a way in which um, other nations, and China in particular, can compete with the current world order below the threshold of what would trigger a, a more serious response. And we're, we're not, we aren't in that space. The first briefer, I thought, did a great job on, on the number of folks that don't have banking accounts in the world. I think it's like, uh, the number in my head is like 2.2 .2 billion people today don't have banking accounts, and it could be off on that. What have we done to contribute to that? Well, let's look at our de-risking operations as a result of, um, of our Patriot Act and, and uh, our war on terror. And what you find today is because of anti-money laundering regimes and, and, the, and uh, CFT requirements and know your cu customer requirements and the penalties uh, after the fact to the institutions that allowed uh, a breach to happen uh, has put a dampening effect on the financial markets and we're not penetrating. And we are, in this, this area, we're not penetrating in the United States, we're not penetrating in, um, in, in, the, in the global markets. And so what we do is we cede human terrain um, to these alternate choices. So yes, it is true that China is out there and, and others are out there, but we are doing things in the physical world um, that made sense at the time that we developed them that I think we have to rethink and ask ourselves going forward, um, does this really, um, how do we need to adjust these various regimes so that we don't necessarily create new unintended problems? Okay, thanks. I wanted to uh, move on to the topic of data localization. Sounds boring, but it's actually very interesting. Um, and Rob, I was wondering if you could tell us how you think China's requirement that companies store data within its border fits into this digital Silk Road plan. Well, um, you know, data localization is a big, big deal. My colleague Nigel Corey is here, who leads our work at ITIF on that. If you're interested in sort of looking at the best work, I'd encourage you to look at Nigel's work at ITIF.org. We just issued a report last Monday called, and it was the 10 worst innovation mercantilist practices of 2018. Really riveting. <laughs> but <laughs> this year, China was, what, two or three, Nigel? Two. So two of the worst practices were from China, and they're both related to this. So the Chinese have this, this policy that says you have to store data. Any data generated in China has to be stored in, date in China. And they use this essentially bogus argument that if somehow data leaves China, it's not private. Well, first of all, they really don't have a privacy regime anyway, so it's probably more private if it goes to another country because they have better privacy. But the point being, it's, just, it's, it's a bogus uh, excuse to essentially do uh, data protectionism. And the reason they do that is they want to have the data centers uh, and cloud computing and other kinds of, in, and other kinds of um, technologies. They want them to be in China. They don't want them to be out of China. So for example, when you look at a company like Amazon Web Services, which is the largest cloud computing provider in the world. Uh, Amazon is now not allowed under Chinese rules to go in and open up a cloud computing business. Yet Alibaba is allowed to come into the US and open up a cloud computing business. Ch Amazon can't do, AWS can't do that and they have to partner with a company, a Chinese company. They have to have the servers in the center, in the servers in there and they have to give them proprietary technology. So. I don't, I don't I, as I said, I think that the Chinese, this is to me a completely unfair trade practice. We should bring a WTO case against it and we should force them to stop. I also uh, am encouraged by uh, um, Prime Minister Abe's leadership in this. Japan now is really, uh, the US is not the leader as much as we should be, uh, but uh, Japan has emerged as the leader now in, in, in trying to craft a new trade regime around open and cross-border data flows, which I think is going to be very critical going forward. China is going to be the big opponent of that, although recently they, they said they wanted to be part of that agreement, which is, I think, a mistake initially because it's, they're not going to live up to it. Uh, and the last point I'll just make on that is I think that um, 
they're, they're not, and they're not imposing us as this regime when they go into these countries. They're not saying if you want to buy our equipment and get our aid, you have to have data localization. But they're encouraging it. They, they go to these countries like Indonesia. I mean, Indonesia is, is, is close to being as bad as China when it comes to data localization. They have at least two new policies, I believe, in that space. And they're looking and going, hmm, we want to grow our tech economy. We want to have all these companies. We want to have data centers. Let's just do what China did. And so again, I think we are, do, are not doing a very good job uh, of articulating why, what the costs are on that. We wrote a report last year where we looked at what the costs are economically to data center localization to domestic companies that have to live under that regime. And they're quite significant. But we don't really promulgate that information adequately enough and go engage our allies and other partners to let them know that. Did anyone else have comments on that, or should we move to our final question? No? OK. <laughs> um, and so, right, I think we'll just do one last question for all the panelists to respond to, and then we'll move into the audience Q&A. So please get your uh, questions ready. Um, so I guess my final question for you guys is broadly, um, how do you think the US and its allies should respond to China's digital Silk Road plan? And just a sort of prediction question, um, where do you see all this shaking out in the next 10 years? I think you already said, you know, we're going to be kicking ourselves, but if you want to expand on that. Well, <clears throat> I look at the world in a pretty uh, Manichaean way, uh, or, or sort of zero sum way, I guess. It's a, somebody gains market share or, or we gain market share. It's not like the pie is fixed. I mean, it's not like the pie, the pie is fixed. And the Chinese either get it or we get it or the Japanese get it or the Chinese get it. And so I think we should fight for every scrap of global market share in advanced technology industries. So when people say, oh, Google shouldn't go into China because they censor, fine, we'll let, we'll let the Chinese companies have all that market share and get none of that revenue coming back to the US to support US companies. I think that's a major, major mistake. I mean, this, to me, this is largely about commercial competition because if we lose that competition, Innovation industries are different. They're not like a call center. If you lose all your call centers and you want to bring them back, you can open them up in a couple of days, just throw a bunch of servers in and a bunch of headphones and train people on how to read a script. But if you lose your AI, if you lose your telecom equipment, if you lose advanced industries, you just don't get them back. And the only way to ever get them is to do what China did, which is steal the technology and massively subsidize it. So, I think that's really the main lesson, is we should just fight for every scrap of that, and that means I, I, I agree with what uh, we just did recently, where um, uh, we put uh, more money into OPEC. I think that was a good idea, but we still don't have an XM bank that's functioning the way it should function. Uh, we don't have a aid policies that are anywhere near sizable enough. Uh, we don't tie them to these kinds of things. So. There's an awful lot we could do. I don't think, I don't think in 10 years the, it, it's a default that the Chinese are going to dominate that region from a digital perspective. But I think if we don't change course, then yes, I believe they will dominate. I think certainly the security um, response and the, what's happening in US courts right now is an important part of um, this whole issue. As someone mentioned earlier, um, the United States right now is very focused on this being strictly a legal matter and not a matter of great power competition. Um, I understand why they're saying that. I think it very clearly is a, a matter of strategic competition and spheres of influence. And so the thinking within policy communities needs to reflect that. Um, also, I touched on this earlier, but the best response from the US and allies is to offer alternatives that are excellent. Um, people don't use the internet based on who provides their network services. People choose the internet based on what is fun and useful and speedy. Um, and the best thing that US tech could do right now is you know, clean its own act up and tell its own story better so that people are going to want to, see, going to, want to choose to use products that are made here or elsewhere as opposed to Chinese products. Um, and the fact is, China's internet right now is awesome. Like, there's so much happening. There's so many apps that are amazing. The online experience is amazing. And this, the whole vibrancy of this market is lost in the, in the US conversation about this. So, so I think going forward, um, US and allies really need to work on providing an alternative that people want to use. Yeah, I, I 
very much agree with what Robin, what Emily just said. I, in terms of um, economic, um, I think we need to have a, a meet and compete. We have great products. Um, we have better products. Um, our system of business um, is uh, underwritten by uh, laws that the international community agree with. So an investment and a partnership with us is one that is dependable for you should you have challenges down the road. I just think that we need to deploy that. Um, but I also think we need to think and, you know, innovatively here about how we want to protect our market advantage. And for those, you know, as Rob said earlier, China goes into, into uh, new areas and um, does, you know, wonderful things such as offering scholarships and work with the community. But they also do bribes. They're, they also um, uh, work in nefarious ways and they work outside the norms uh, to maintain a foothold and then to exploit a competitive advantage. And I think that needs to be called out through tariffs and subsidies and, and, and import quotas and whatever it's going to take to, um, to, to address that. So as we are deploying um, uh, our products and, our, our, and, and enabling the reach of um, our economic reach, I think likewise we have to be attuned um, to, um, to where China exercises um, uh, uh, things that um, fall outside you know, international norms and clearly in violation of the way in which we would like all nations, including ourselves, to behave, and we need to put pressure on that. I also would ask that, uh, that we, I think another area that we um, need, to, and this is tangential to um, extending the reach, the economic reach of, uh, of the West, is we need to go back and look at um, um, the, the political, how cyber in this, this, this environment has enabled uh, new forms of political power. And I don't think we in the West have done a very good job of, of challenging um, as, a, as a way of policy, um, if you will, political warfare in the sense that, you know, there's a lot that we could be doing um, to um, market our capabilities, to identify and make known uh, where there are rules breakers where in, and, uh, and to uh, provide feedback uh, to countries that don't um, that that block that so so that you know in, in addition to extending um, um, the, the reach of, of the economic arm um, we are also using um, the political um, arm to um, help um, create um, expectations of behavior and use that um, as a way to um, put pressure uh, for those that seek to, uh, mainly China and others, that seek to, to do something that I think um, it, it disserves the, uh, the global community. Thanks. Um, I would like to add one serious deficiency with the Chinese internet, though, is people can't read our stories, <laughs> um, which I know you, you very well know. Um, so uh, thank you so much to all the panelists for your comments, and I think we'd like to move to the Q&A now. Um, please wait for the microphone to get to you, and then please identify yourselves before speaking, and then ask a, a question as opposed to uh, making a statement if possible. Thank you. Sorry, where are the mics actually? Oh, they're there. Oh, okay. Um, sorry, uh, this, this woman in red, please. <laughs> That's a good idea to wear red to a panel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Mariam Bax from Inside Cybersecurity. My question is for the uh, retired Lieutenant General. Um, there's a, a couple of, not a preamble, but just a couple of uh, notes. So you mentioned the defensive position, the inherently defensive position we find ourselves in given the sort of intangible nature of the cyber realm. And then you also mentioned that our fate is sort of tied to uh, the practices of private industry. Um, I wonder how you feel about requiring private companies to uh, institute best those cyber best practices versus so it, like voluntary, you know, best ha having having it be on a voluntary basis. Actually, crafting regulations for patching or other sorts of pr best practices like that. And, and let me make sure I understand the question. The idea would that we would raise uh, the standards of, of performance to meet baseline cybersecurity requirements.
Yes, uh, I, you use a tricky word standard um, because that standard is sometimes seen as something that people can do but shouldn't, don't have to do. Um, I'm speaking specifically about regulations, but if, if you're saying that regulations might equal a raising of the standard, that would be noteworthy. Yeah, I, let me start it, and Rob, if I could ask you to help me with this. I, you know, I think I understand, which is, um, look, I, I do think there needs to be standards, and I do think that we need to, as part of our, um, if anything, not to, to bring greater assurances to the, uh, the trust um, envelope that I think is often lacking. And I think to the extent that we can promote that uh, with partners and allies in, in the international community and, and, and in partnership uh, with the business community and the, and, and the various verticals that are already in the space, I think that's a good thing. I think that would be, that's, a, that's an example of where I think we can lead. Um, that's the sort of thing that I think um, is exactly what we should do. I think there's a leadership component to that. And well, I think one place to start, there have been a number of stories in the last few months about how the Chinese have gotten virtually all of the data and plans and IP for major weapon systems, including submarines uh, and fighter jets. Uh, and they got them not from the OEMs, but they got them from the suppliers. And uh, I read something, I'm not going to get the number right, but a significant share of DOD suppliers are not using state-of-the-art cybersecurity practices. And why DOD allows this to happen, I, uh, maybe there are reasons for that, but um, you got, to me, if I was running DOD, I'd say you got, you know, six months to fix it or else, and we're going to buy from some other supplier. I mean, these are pretty vulnerable systems. and. Uh, uh, it's not rocket science. I mean, you can make systems that are pretty secure, uh, or you can do stupid things like have your password be password. So. On that point, there was a, um, a GAO report that came out in October of 18 that, that said that um, it uh, found that um, DOD's um, weapon system acquisition program for future weapon systems, about a 1.7 trillion dollar portfolio was deemed by them uh, to be at significant risk to, to, to cyber threats. And the reason it was is for years and decades, um, services who state who make the requirements and, and manufacture and, and RD and RD T and E work and the part of, um, of, um, of businesses were not, um, failed to, to heed the warning and to, and to bake in, uh, those requirements. And so today, if you're to believe the report, and I think there's, I think DOD would, would respond that it's not exactly that bad, but somewhere in the middle, if you were to look at that and you say, well, why is it? Because we just didn't have stated standards in, in the acquisition pro process that you must build to, and they can't, they can't be debated. You either do it or you don't do it. And if you don't do it, you don't get the contract. We don't have those sorts of things in place. And, and um, uh, I'm confident we'll redress all the problems that were identified in the report, but it's gonna cost us more than it costs the current program right now, and that's, that's, that's not right. Um, okay, can we get uh, the mics to this gentleman in, in this block here with the purplish shirt? <laughs> Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Rakab Malik. I'm a Fulbright Scholar currently at the uh, Seeger Center, Elliot School. Um, I'm gonna follow on from what Emily said at, right at the end. Um, when you were doing the session, and talking about the strategic power play between uh, the U.S. and China, and the rise of China in that respect, I'm writing about this, so, so I'm particularly interested in this. Um, so, given that, uh, if we look at the Chinese perception of the way the world is, I mean, that's how you're going to be able to really fathom about how they're rising, what they're doing, and why they're blocking everything. Um, that we can significantly say that uh, Chinese companies are a strategic threat then. Um, and that because China's blocking uh, access into their market space, especially in the digital realm, uh, would we ever be doing that in the West? I mean, I'm a Brit, so I've got to consider that part, but uh, in the US as well. And um, given that's a, that that's the case, um, over the last couple of decades, but especially in the last 15 years, uh, the U.S. particularly has lost a lot of access to future technology resources, for example, rare earth minerals. Um, Afghanistan being one of those, which it occupied for a long time, uh, and is still doing so. So 
uh, and the, the find in rare earth minerals there uh, to be exploited, which the Chinese are actively seeking access to. So given that uh, this is a scenario of the next few years and the decades uh, to come, and this is a significant power play by the Chinese, and this is just one aspect of that, um, to compete uh, in the strategic realm, um, what are the consequences uh, or the potentially l potential likelihood of blocking complete access to Chinese companies in, in the US as well? Will that actually occur or not? Because you're not going to get it the other way. Does that make sense? Well, look, it's a little bit like somebody's punching you in the face and you say, uh, geez, if I punch you in the face, I've started the fight. I mean, you look at, for example, uh, and I'm going to get the name of the company wrong, but it's um, uh, the, uh, the semiconductor company. It's basically a DRAM company, a memory company in China. It was bankrolled completely by the uh, Chinese Integrated Circuit Fund, a $100 billion fund. It got about three Are you talking about Jinwa? Pardon? Jinwa? Not, not Xinhua, the, the, the other smaller group, the Fujian, I think. Fujian Jinhua. Yeah, Fujian yeah. Jinhua, yeah, thank you. So they got like three billion or three and a half billion dollars to build this ginormous uh, DRAM factory. Um, and the way, they were, the way they got their technology was they stole it. They, they, they bribed people who, in, in Taiwan to steal Micron technology. Luckily, they were caught. Uh, and the Trump administration did this very clever thing. Uh, it was like one of the best things they've done, in my view, in this space, is they basically cut off their ability to buy the equipment that you need to make these things, these chips, which, because we have, we have enough, that's an area where we do have enough market power, we can do that. And, and the company announced two weeks ago they were going bankrupt. It was going to go bankrupt and close in, in April. So like, and the quote I had in the paper was, it proves that crime doesn't pay. So when, in my view, when the Chinese, when you have pretty clear evidence that the Chinese are doing that, we should, we should block our markets when you have clear evidence. There's a case in the paper last week about a company, I don't remember their name, but they make essentially push to talk radios that the police use and, and other first responders. Uh, pretty clear evidence that they stole that technology from Motorola. Um, and, and we blocked sort of the phone, <laughs> we blocked like the, 2.0 phone that stole it, but we're letting in the 3.0 phone. I mean, it's like, look, in my view, if, you, if it's pretty clear evidence, you know, beyond a preponderance of a doubt that you have stolen American technology, you should not get access to our markets. And uh, eventually, the Chinese companies will figure out that there is a price to pay for this kind of behavior. This kind of behavior, by the way, is rampant. I mean, it's, it's not just like an occasional thing. And it, somebody, there was a quote today uh, uh, by somebody, well, it doesn't matter that they stole Tappy, the thing for Timo, uh, the little finger thing. <laughs> sure, if that's all it is, but it's not. It's much, much more sophisticated. So I, I don't, I'm not worried about that. I think <clears throat> at some point you have to send the Chinese a message that says crime does not pay and, and you're going to have to pay the price for it. And the Europeans and the Japanese, to me, have to align with us to do that as well. Um, just to clarify, sir, were you also talking about, you know, would the U.S. block Chinese companies from, like, coming into the U.S. and selling their products there? Was that also part of your question? Because if so, I just wanted to say that I think we have seen that um, in some cases with CFIUS, the uh, Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., where they've moved to block uh, certain attempts by Chinese entities to expand their business operations here due to national security reasons. And one of those companies is certainly a, a key player in this digital Silk Road, which is uh, Ant Financial, um, you know, part of Alibaba. When they tried to uh, buy MoneyGram, that transaction was stopped due to these types of concerns. So, I mean, it wasn't the type of uh, blocking of market access that I think we're seeing China engage in, but it was, I guess, a U.S. form of that. Um, sorry, we'll, we'll go, can we go to this gentleman in, in the very front here? Thank you. Uh, Chris McRae, Norman McRae Foundation. 
I wanted to challenge something that I thought I heard Robert say 15 minutes ago, which I think was that all trade is a zero-sum game. I, I, I want to start from a sustainability goals perspective of you know, progress for the human lot. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, all progress for the human lot from the sort of bottom up uh, is potentially win-win. So I've studied Banglad work in Bangladesh. I've been over there 15 times. And uh, if, for example, women who 40 years ago had no life because they were dying at 35, because uh, the, the health was so bad and everything, are, are you know, uh, now surviving to 65 and then building uh, last mile health from the village up. That's a win-win-win for everyone. So I, I, I think there's a really big problem that if you look only at GDPs, you're not looking at education or you're not looking at the intergenerational things which multiply value, which are relevant to all the sustainability goals at their deepest. And th that's, that's the thing I'd like some clarity on, because it, it seems to me if we only look at things from the top down and say everything is a zero-sum game, then OK, uh, you know, we're never going to achieve any sustainability progress, and no one is going to trust anyone who uses only those models. Well, just to be clear, I didn't say everything is a zero-sum game. I said. Global competition in technology industries is largely a zero-sum game. Nor do I believe that the sort of Silk Road, digital Silk Road efforts are, you know, probably pretty good. I mean, these countries need these technologies, and then and 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 uh, the Chinese are providing them. My complaint with the Chinese is not really about digital Silk Road. It's about this set of unfair mercantilist practices that underlie that or underpin that. I will say one last thing on sustainability. If you look at the UN's 20, or I think it's 20 sustainable development goals, growing GDP and productivity is not one of them. Uh, I'll tell you the most important thing for somebody in India, <clears throat> it's more money. You know, Indian GDP per capita is abysmal. It's super, super low. It's about 12% or 13% of US GDP. The single most important thing we could do to help India would be to help them to grow their GDP. So I think it's, I get that there are other things that are also important, but sort of dismissing GDP growth when you're super poor, I think, is just consigning people to poverty. So I actually would argue that GDP growth is probably the most important thing we can do in the emerging markets to help them get a better life. Um, okay, so we're coming up on the last sort of 10 to 15 minutes, so maybe we can take three questions at once, and then the panelists can sort of respond uh, that way. Um, so. How about this gentleman here, this gentleman here, and oh no, there's so many more people. Um, <laughs> um, and I guess this gentleman here in the purple tie, I'm trying to like geographically distribute. I um, think uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for all your insights. Um, two very short questions. One is to follow up on Kay's earlier remark on CFIUS, uh, which is both in CIF, uh, the CFIUS expansion and then uh, last year's um, and the EU's uh, decision to come up with a framework for investment screening. Both mention that um, the, uh, national security grounds for blocking or reviewing certain transactions, uh, merchants and acquisitions. Um, my question is, in the age when conventional manufacturing is increasingly integrated into the digital space, how do we define national security? And is our governments the best agents to actually make this definition instead of leaving it to the market to sort out? And the second question is, um, I think uh, earlier last month, uh, Deutsche Telekom came out with a paper basically cautioning uh, governments in Europe that disallowing and banning Huawei equipment from the 5G network in Europe is going to severely hinder the ability of a European company to roll out uh, 5G technologies across the continent and in turn would hinder the progress of uh, digital technology on the entire continent. So my question is, if you know we have decided collectively that Huawei is such a security sweat, a threat that we, we are banning it from the whole market, what other alternatives? You know, should governments take the lead and how should it be done? Is it a government-driven effort, or should it be public-private partnership or something like that? OK, thanks. And then the, the second question? Oh, oh right. Um, 
sorry, can we have a microphone here? Got one here. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you for choosing me, even though I'm wearing all black today. But uh, my name is Michael Armeo, and I, I run a um, market risk analysis firm. And my question in the commercial sense dovetails on two comments, one that I've heard from General Mayville and one that I heard from Dr. Atkinson, uh, with respect to some systemic issues that U.S. and European companies run into in selling their wares uh, in the digital Silk Road area. Uh, for example, dealing with companies who euphemistically say, well, U.S. companies don't want to sell to us, which basically means they don't want to pay underneath the table. So most U.S. executives don't want to go to jail for violating the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Certain number of European companies, most companies have an equivalent, the British do, I know. So with that being said, you have then Dr. Atkinson's comment about taking Chinese companies to the WTO, with the current administration's disdain for the WTO, as exemplified by, for example, not even wanting to uh, name judges to the appellate division, what would the panel's take be on dealing with these systemic issues and the current political environment for us to be able to represent companies in that area? Thank you. Okay, thanks, and the, and the third question, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you, and thank you for uh, calling on bipartisan purple on State of the Union Day, I guess. <laughs> um, I'm Bill Hederman from University of Pennsylvania. I was wondering if we could uh, talk a moment about China's Silk Road, et cetera, in, in Venezuela. It seems like this is a place where we're going to have some of the uh, these practices move from theory to problems really quickly. I'd just be interested in your insights on that. Thank you. Uh, those are all great questions. Um, maybe, uh, uh, Emily, can I start with you? And if, you, if there's one you want to respond to, or we can throw it to the... So, well, so the first question is about should uh, countries be in charge of determining national security priorities, or should that be left to the private sector? And I think sort of inherently given its national security, it would have to be determined by the government. Um, but I'm sure companies would love it if that weren't the case <laughs> because they could probably make a lot more money. Um, sure. And, uh, yeah, anything yeah. else you wanted to add? On, on that, I'll just say briefly, um, you know, do I think governments do a good job of abusing the term national security? Absolutely. Um, China does it. The United States has done it. Um, but in terms of leaving it to the market, um, I'll come back to an earlier point I made earlier, which is people, including and particularly me, are, are really stupid. And <laughs> we all, when it comes to tech, make lazy decisions and often act against our best interests, particularly our security and privacy interests. So as imperfect as it is, I don't, I don't see a market as the best um, mediator of, of, of security. Um, because we've seen all the time that people make very, very poor decisions. But of course, um, governments can abuse national security, and and that's something that is a really key issue for both sides here. Um, and then we, the two other main questions are about the WTO and, and Venezuela. So, did either of you want to respond to those? So I can do the WTO. I don't know anything about what we're doing on Venezuela. I think. Um, I don't think the administration is as down on the WTO as you might think. I mean, Dennis Shea is the U.S. ambassador to the WTO. I think he's doing a really excellent job. Um, Lighthizer has signed on at least one case as part of the, actually, I think maybe a couple. So I wouldn't say it's not an avenue. In our view, it should be a stronger avenue. And I think, I think the administration should push along with our European allies for serious WTO reform. The administration is right that the WTO really doesn't work right. Uh, there's a really good paper by Mark Wu, who used to be at USTR and now at Harvard Business School, or Harvard Law on uh, the failure of the WTO when it comes to China. Uh, I think he's absolutely right. But you don't want to throw away the bathwater. I, I don't know enough about um, 
about uh, foreign corrupt practices law to say um, whether that could be something under the WTO jurisdiction if you were to reform the WTO. It's, it's an intriguing idea that I think we all ought to look at. Uh, but I will say that you know we are competing with one hand tied behind our back when when other when our competitors can put a big bribe under the table, a lot easier for them to get the contract than us. And you know I don't know what to do about that, but I think it's naive for us to say we're going to be the beacon of uh, light and goodness, and that somehow that's going to accrue to our commercial advantage. There are lots of cases where it's not going to accrue; it's going to accrue to our competitors who don't have to live by those rules. So whether you can figure out a way to get more of a global regime on that and get these countries uh, part of it. I, I, don't know, I don't know the answer to that, but it seems like an area we should move forward on. Um, did you want to talk about Venezuela? Or? I'll try because um, it's a great question. It's it happening in our backyard right now, and we have been um, for too long ignoring um, this, these, these issues, and in, in particular Venezuela. So here's a, let me be a little bit of a futurist with, with where I think we could be going as, as a government. So let's think about the, the human catastrophe that is Venezuela. And we will no doubt we should lead the effort to address and redress the humanitarian crisis that, that is there now. But then on the heels of that, why aren't we looking at de development differently instead of it in the way that I remember it when my days in Iraq and Afghanistan, why aren't we looking at how um, we can partner with um, um, uh, industry to promote um, uh, it, local entrepreneurism? Um, why aren't we exploring um, ways in which we could, for example, create um, uh, fiat-based um, global chains tokenize things locally. There's ways to do that. You get an anchor bank, you get a, you, you, you get um, a, uh, uh, a blockchain uh, online banking system. Um, uh, you deploy it the way you would deploy, um, the way you say USAID would deploy aid. Um, you think about it strategically, but now what you're trying to do is to foster uh, an entrepreneurial spirit and you empower that by extending this technology. I stretched a little bit, but that's the sort of creative things that I think we, we have to think about deploying uh, in the future. So I, it's, it's, I clumsily addressed Venezuela, but I, but I, I tried. Um, on CFIUS, I absolutely believe it is the role and responsibility of government um, to, to be a leader here. I think no other force can do that, and I think this is precisely what government is supposed to be doing. I do accept, however, um, the observation that today um, the technology moves too fast for policy to govern and that uh, it's very, very difficult um, to uh, assess the risks forward. Um, but none of those two reasons aren't um, justification uh, to find some alternative system. And I think we are caught flat-footed here. Um, I think there are new partnerships. Uh, there's a way to inform that process, but I think it's absolutely something that um, government should do. Uh, thanks. And just one last quick, super quick thing on Venezuela. I, I assume that you may have been referring to the blockbuster Reuters report last year about how ZTE was working with uh, Venezuela to track um, its own citizens. And that really is such a fantastic story that if, if you're interested in this issue, you know, you've probably read it, or if you haven't, I would recommend it. And I was heartened to see that there were requests from senators here uh, for the U.S. government to probe that issue, because I think as you pointed out, that really is sort of an example of some of the worst fears that people have about China exporting this model um, of digitization around the world. Um, so thank you for flagging that. And thank you everyone for coming to this event. And I hope you have a great lunch. And I release you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. <laughs>